Because we talk about innovation a lot, right? We don't talk enough about resistance to innovation. If there's something in place already, the resistance, the switch cost is so big, it's really hard to kick something out in existence. Thanks for joining us on Forging the Future. And I'd like to welcome Sunny Chung, founding partner of Born Global Ventures, founder of True Leap, and a marketing professor extraordinaire at the University of St. Thomas. Sunny, what don't you do? <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> welcome Such a to the show. To be here. Yeah, finally, we get to sit down and have a conversation. So tell me uh, a little bit about your early interests and how you came to be a Houstonian. All right. Um, looking back, I guess I will start from uh, myself as a researcher. Like 20 years ago, when I was doing my master's, I developed an app um, to collect data through online survey. If you remember MSN Messenger days, Chris? Oh, yeah, definitely. It shows our age, right? Mm -hmm. um, to look at why people are not doing online shopping. So it's like risk perception of e-commerce. Um, I had no idea that could have been a... a technology company like SurveyMonkey or Quatrix and a unicorn someday, I simply defended my master's and applied for a PhD and came to the United States uh, to do my PhD in marketing. That's how I started at um, the Indiana University Kelly School of Business for, for my PhD. Uh, and then at that time, if you remember, like about 15 years ago, Facebook, MySpace, they were booming like crazy acquiring users, but then they weren't able to convert their users into revenue. So um, I was looking at how the way people are connected in a network, like um, the tie strength and network structure is affecting their decision making and an attitude when it comes to new product adoption, let's say a six wheeler sports car, you know, you're not sure how you want to respond. So you look around to see people in your network, how they're thinking about it. So again, I developed two apps and didn't turn any of those into a company, went on as a marketing um, professor at Colorado State University um, when my life partner, also business partner, Sandeep, uh, was in Houston and still in Houston, essentially long distance for eight years. Our first child was born. We had to make a choice. I moved to Houston and joined the University of St. Thomas and also find myself right in the heart of Houston's innovation district. And, you know, around then, I've already been doing research on the mechanism of innovation, diffusion, and adoption, working with uh, startup companies, identifying what's missing in early stage venture building. So to answer your question, I became a Houstonian uh, 2012 when I moved here uh, to be with my family. But I also wanted to share a very personal fact, which is also where I feel really deeply connected with you when you shared your house being um, destructed by a hurricane in Florida. So I really consider myself truly a Houstonian after Harvey happened because mm -hmm. our house was in six feet of water for two weeks. <laughs> Baptized by the flood. <laughs> exactly. Um, but then that's when everybody just came together, regardless of what language we speak, how we look, where we came from. And um, instead of being depressed or, you know, feeling down, we actually came out and um, started a lot of, you know, neighborhood and community initiatives like Rainbow Library, just bring books to the kids and the family and have everybody gather Essentially, the flood got us out of our little house, but really, you know, found a bigger um, community in Houston where I truly felt like, wow, this is the spirit of Houston. We go through crisis together and we're resilient. That's when I really consider myself a very proud Houstonian because when you see a line, it's not to line up to get materials. It's to line up and be a volunteer and help others. That's very true. We're very collaborative and uh, I can see how you feel that way. But when did you have the epiphany that some of these ideas that you had could make a good startup? You said it sounds like you passed that up a few times. Right? I did. <laughs> and that's really um, what I call the fragmentation of the ecosystem. So if you think about 
the startup world, there's the researchers, the technologist, you know, the scientist, engineer, they come up with IPs, like they have a lot of advances, but most of them are stuck either in research labs or clinical trials or maybe garage or, you know, your closet. And it takes forever. In my case, it was like 20 years in the making. Mm. <laughs> and that's when we really look at the early stage venture building and identify there's that chicken egg kind of dilemma. It's almost like, you know, I need the funds and the support to, to turn this um, technology into a company. Um, but then when you're looking at investors, they want to see traction. It's almost like, how am I going to get there before I get the support? And that's really what motivated us to have a one-stop shop where you're not only getting the fund, but also the support um, to have all it takes. And I believe that is really the solution to bridge that gap or so-called valley of death. Mm. Um, because if you look around, you know, there are all kinds of service providers, but they're really divided and you have to piece them together. And a lot of time, energy and capital is wasted. So eventually we, dis, uh, we believe that, uh, we, we believe that the venture studio model is the solution to build startups much cheaper, faster with higher success rate and higher return. And so that's when you decided to start born global ventures. That's exactly. Which is a venture decided. fund and a studio, right? Uh, yes, we are focusing on our venture studio. We have our in-house software developers, of course, marketers and, uh, you know, all it takes IP lawyers and um, finance accounting. Just imagine for uh, entrepreneurs, you could just focus on what you do best and not worry about all the back office operation. Mm -hmm. And because we share the back office resources for each portfolio company, the cost of operations is much lower. because. You know, as venture capitalists, we always talk about 10x return, but, you know, in today's um, external environment, we really want to revisit what about one tenth cost when we are building companies, mm. right? Because in the early days, you don't really need a full blown um, back office for each company. And that's really how we can operate much more um, effectively. That makes sense. Well, as you know, we have a venture studio, so you don't have to sell me on the idea. Absolutely. But, uh, <laughs> I'm feeling like I'm preaching to the choir, but yeah. that's also when I first discovered your work, Chris, I was so excited mm. to see uh, there are more studios in Houston because I really believe for emerging ecosystem, uh, studios are actually playing a much bigger role because we're, we don't have that kind of density as in mature ecosystem like Silicon, for example, and um, having the studio model, like what you guys are doing having in-house support, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, these, a lot of these startups really need that incubation, and acceleration. But why Born Global? Why did you name it that? So um, I'm glad you asked because mm -hmm. we were first known as Z Lab years ago when we first started to address the gap um, in Z Lab for Zhang, for Zhang, Shang. You would Shang. think Z is for my last name, oh. but. Z stands for the last letter of the alphabet, which is, you know, the beginner, like the early stage founders and all the underserved, underappreciated founders like women, minority immigrants. I know you guys care a whole lot about them too. Um, and pretty much everybody that's either fresh off the boat or last one in line and just all kinds of underdogs. But if we really need to pick one that is most inclusive, we really zoomed in to immigrant entrepreneurs because immigrants also include women and include minorities. Um, and also data shows 55% of US unicorns have at least one foreign born entrepreneur. Um, and I also wanted to mention since I came to the country as an international student, so did Sandeep, um, among US unicorns, at least 25 percent of them have at least a founder that came to the United States as an international student. And I can share even more data in terms of, you know, the fact that they're twice likely to start a company. They're also twice likely to have a patent and um, IP. Um, essentially, you know, they're the high performing founders that we identified. And that's the reason um, we, you know, we are founder wise focusing on immigrant and foreign born entrepreneurs. But there's something a lot of people did not know. So Born Global 
actually came from business research literature.、Mm. So again, you know, as a marketing professor, I've been teaching international business、uh, forever, and there's a、um, there's a really strong body of literature about born global companies. So as opposed to you know mom and pop small businesses that gradually grow to cover the city, the state, the country, and then go international. Born global companies are those that have a global strategy from day one. So, especially tech companies, right? Like you know what we focus on, both soft tech and born global software companies. There's really no border when it comes to digital innovation. So, in other words, you know if you focus on the global market from day one, you would be a born global company, and that's why、uh, born global ventures.、Um, we're actually. You know, working with globally born entrepreneurs to build globally scalable companies. Well, that's interesting because I think、uh, many startups, if they start、uh, without that born global focus, they, they, like you said, they start out building locally and then they think about global much later. But、mm-hmm. a global、um, founder would already have that in mind. Absolutely, coming from the world, and then really, I mean. This is what made America great in the past. Is the is the great melting pot? People coming here,、um, integrating into the you know United States, founding businesses,、uh, and I'm 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 happy to hear that that's still you know very much alive and well, right? Absolutely, fifty five percent. And so when people talk about closing borders and some of these other things, right? I mean, you really have to keep in mind that. Uh, the land of opportunity is what's drawn people here to found those businesses, and then they become global businesses and, and forces in the world.、Um, so, um, now you've been teaching for over twenty years.、Um, what else do you think is critical、uh, for startup businesses to consider? All right, so because、um, I teach marketing and of course management, entrepreneurship, e business,、mm-hmm. um, what I'm seeing is, I think when pe- when founders are building, they are focused on the product, and not as much on the marketplace.、Mm-hmm. So there's this debate between so-called product driven versus market driven, and I'm a hundred percent market oriented. Because when it comes to product market fit, right? You know that's really where you have to have your, your validation. It's really not just a matter of how advanced your technology is. It's it's about is there a market that's ready to adopt? You know, so passionate about what you can offer and convert that technology into value.、Um, and then、uh, in addition to that, we also look at you know product market, but also founder and investor fit. And if you think about that from a marketing perspective, it's all about this whole value chain、um, that goes beyond just the product or say the technology itself. So that's something I see a lot of times missing. Essentially, the people piece of innovation, and not just the technology or say the product itself. You know, eventually, I really believe、um, entrepreneurs and innovators are solving humanity problems and not just. Technology problems, right? You know, a lot of global challenges. Speaking of globally scalable, are challenges that we're facing. So essentially, in- instead of holding a hammer to find the nail, like you need to really identify where's the biggest problem and who are your target market, and honestly, build with them.、Mm. So I have a theory that your best angels are actually your、um, Your users, like in the early days, the early adopters are almost like your angels who are willing to work with you when you don't have the perfect product yet. So that's well, how we. Interesting. I mean, when you're saying marketing, I think of like selling, but you <laughs>、yes. know, what, when you're saying marketing, you mean about getting that product market fit or understanding where you fit in the market.、Right? Oh my goodness,、uh, mm. Chris, you brought such a great point.、Mm. So.、Um, If I may wear my professor hat for a second,、um, essentially there's such a narrow definition of what marketing means. You're absolutely right. Most of people would think marketing is just selling or promoting or social media or nowadays influencer. Marketing is way bigger than that. You know, if I throw the marketing strategy planning process, that's only one box out of the twelve boxes we talk about. It starts with market research.、Mm. It starts with、uh, situation analysis. Identify who would be your best target market, 
and then have clear goals and objectives, and then develop what we call the four Ps, which is marketing mix, which includes actually, first of all, product strategy, which include branding here, and then pricing, which is another you know killer point for a lot of founders, and uh, place, which is also so-called channel of distribution, logistics, how are you gonna deliver the value to your final users, and promotion. Mm. So essentially, it's a very comprehensive process. And in fact, the best companies like Apple and Google, they're actually a marketing company. The entire company have that research-driven, strategy-coordinated implication implementation process in mind. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Well, we both have venture studios, mm -hmm. but tell me a little bit more about yours. Yeah, absolutely. This mm. is something we're super excited about, right? Um, essentially, we started as uh, co-builders and investors with founders. Essentially, we are a studio that have a combination of internal ideation and external ideation. In other words, some of the ideas were generated, you know, by myself and my partner Sandeep. Um, usually, you know, the education side and the commerce side um, would be me leading, and then Sandeep coming from um, Sandeep coming from energy background is leading a lot of uh, projects on energy transition and climate tech. So essentially, we're very much hands-on. In other words, um, unlike traditional VC fund kind of model where you write a check and then you provide you know, guidance and support, but pretty much the founders are on their own uh, expecting return down the road, we're very much hands-on. In other words, we're involved in the day-to-day -day operation of our portfolio companies. Mm. So if I may use an analogy, Chris, we really consider um, you know, the company creation process in studio almost like making babies. <laughs> Let's just say, you know, making baby startups, right? Um, essentially, we, first of all, want to have the house where the baby can share toys, books, clothes, which reduced operation cost and share the same back office. And we also want to pace the babies so we don't have let's say 10 of them all going to college mm. and applying and doing the field trips. We want to pace them so that um, you have a kid that's going to college, you have another one that's entering into high school, you have another one like in kindergarten though, so that they're sort of- So how many babies do you have at one time yeah. in the studio? <laughs> this is an excellent question. Mm. Um, so as of right now, we have about 10, 12, depending on how you define, you know, whether they're born or infancy stage. Um, but at one time, we have uh, about three to four active building, like the ones that are going to, heading to college, getting the SAT, getting the, you know, portfolio together. So essentially, um, we have them paced. So one is fundraising, the other one is pilot testing, the next one is uh, under development, the next one is, mm. you know, validation market. What's the stage. mix between ones that you're actually coming up with on your own versus maybe ones that you come across? Um, yeah, so as of right now, I would say um, slightly majority that is coming from internal ideation. So a couple of example, maybe TrueLeap, which mm. is a global education data company. That was my original idea. And then we onboarded co-founders to build with us. And then um, Sandeep had an idea uh, that turned into Geocamp Pro, which is a tracking app um, serving energy companies from 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 field to sink. So mm. that's very much you know heavy um, energy industry that we brought co-founders to build together. And then we also have data scientists who would come with an algorithm that helps average um, households save hundreds of dollars on their energy plan. Um, and in those cases, we bring them in and we become co-founders, we invest in them, and we also provide the software development, mm. the business development. We were literally in the BD meetings with energy provider companies. You're not going to be expecting a data scientist to do those kind of uh, meetings. Mm. So that's how much we're involved in the day-to-day -day operation and depends on our involvement, our equity in those companies also vary. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of differences between uh, one venture studio to another, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, our model right now, at least, is not to create, you know, come up with our own idea and mm -hmm. get a co-founder or, or a found, bring in a, an executive and then like curate that. 
we uh, have studios that apply and then we select and then we bring them in and fund them and mentor them and yep. pair them with our engineers. Um, there might be a time at some point where we have an idea and we mm-hmm. want to take that model, but how do you recruit your co-founders then in that case? You have an idea, but now you got to put a team in place in order to implement it, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Chris. Mm-hmm. And I also echo your point about if you've met one studio, you've met one studio. Mm-hmm. Unlike incubators and accelerators where or, you know, the process is quite similar. I would say you're absolutely right to studios very greatly. Some are external ideation, high alpha, for example, my great friend Scott that I just saw at IU Venture Summit. Mm. Uh, high alpha is also external ideation. They onboard uh, founders to their studio and co-build and invest. Uh, in our case, because um, both Sandeep and I are, you know, have tons of, like over the years, I already mentioned a few, right? Um, tons of ideas that we validate. We're very uh, rigorous in terms of the market validation process. It's not just like, hey, we have a studio, we're just going to have fun with our ideas. We actually work very closely with our users to validate before we decide that is uh, uh, an idea worth pursuing before we start building. So validation in early stage is very important before we even bring um, co-founders on board. Where do you find those co-founders though? Yeah. So to answer your question, it is number one, the network we've built over time, mm-hmm. myself coming from academic background, you know, um, close ties with researchers, scientists. Um, but then on the other hand, Sandeep also has tons of really amazing world-class experts from his, um, over a decade, uh, experience from the the energy industry. So essentially from our own network to start with, mm-hmm. but you probably also saw our community building effort. We do um, have a nonprofit organization called Born Global Community, which is a 501c3 community where we're just paying forward and giving back by sharing our resources and our learning and our connections to with other entrepreneurs and also investors so that we can connect local and international ecosystems and support more diverse founders and investors, entrepreneurs in general, either foreign born or native born, as long as you have a global mindset. Mm. So from that community, we're also sourcing a lot of amazing talents to co-build together and also nurture the next generation of entrepreneurs. Like they may be already building their current company, but next time when they build, they know studio can help them build faster and cheaper. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to work with more of the founders from the community as well. And it is a global effort, right? So you have teams that are over in India, also people here. I mean, is there a physical studio or is it more virtual? Yeah, so before COVID, we were at uh, Station Houston, if you remember the Fanning building. Um, sure. And then, you know, they shifted to um, uh, today's uh, ION. Um, And then during COVID, we're proud to say that we never got affected or say, you know, uh, we've always been a global virtual team. So when everybody had to make the switch, we just continued operating our global team. uh, And we didn't feel the need to have a physical office after COVID. What we do feel the need is event space where we gather with our partners, with our community collaborators. Um, and when when we have event need, uh, we're blessed enough to have local partners that have the event space. They're looking for content providers and community to contribute. Mm-hmm. So essentially it worked out that we, we still have ongoing in-person event as well as online programs, yeah. partnering with our community strategic partners. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I believe so. Well, um, in venture capital, everyone is looking for a unicorn, right? Mm-hmm. And, but should a startup's goal to be to become a unicorn? <laughs> <laughs> well, especially right now, it seems like the unicorn um, birth has been on hold. And we have to reconsider, like, are we all looking for unicorns? And at this environment, again, you know, going back to Houston's feature resilience, right? We really believe it is the cockroach founders we should be (laughs) looking for because they cannot be killed. If you Mm. remember, I know you're also a big sci-fi fan. 
you know, the last one standing along with Wally when everybody <laughs> went to the space was a little cockroach. Yeah. And, you know, especially with all the adversities and the short of funding right now, it is really a test to see because Warren Buffett, was it Warren Buffett, had a quote, uh, it's only when the tide goes down, yeah. you see who's swimming naked. Yeah. So I actually believe right now it's a great test to see who are building substantial companies and who are the most resilient founders that cannot be killed. And if I put, you know, a better word, maybe um, we could also call them a phoenix founder. Mm. In other words, you just keep killing them and they'll come keep coming back to life. And we believe immigrant founder have that kind of um, uh, we, we believe immigrant founders have that kind of characteristics because usually they've been through a lot of hardships, almost like, bring it on. We've seen worse. We've been through tougher situations. That has to be, uh, <laughs> on the application. Are you a cockroach? <laughs> <laughs> we do ask, give us an example, um, of you facing hardship in the past and show our resilience. So definitely, you know, we, we want to find out if they can, um, if they can handle tough situations. Well, there's four quotients, right? There's IQ, EQ, SQ. Yep. And the fourth one for startup founders is AQ, okay, which is adversity quotient, which is about the cockroach. Although I think cockroach is not such a, is not as a sexy term as unicorn. I, yeah. I, I want to try to change it to tardigrade. Yeah. You know, because that's another, you know, the little water bear, water bear right. you know, yeah. that thing you can't kill either. That's right. right. So that's right. It's a little more sci-fi for me. So yep. we're looking for tardigrade founders um, and startups. Uh, well, what can we improve in the current venture studio model to maybe better equip the startups besides uh, give them a um, roach, um, keep them away from the roach motels? <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great question, uh, Chris. I really think right now it is a great pause and reflect moment for the entire venture ecosystem to think, you know, is the traditional VC approach working? Um, what else can we do to ensure the success of these companies and not just, you know, add valuation every time when we raise, you know, just adding check. So what we found, number one, is the combination of investing through what we call four capital. One is, of course, the financial capital, but I use the little finger because people would think, a lot of founders, they would make the comment, if only I have the money, right? But then once they get the money, they realize, oops, I need more than the money. So as proven by the people that have gotten hundreds of millions of dollars in funding and still managed to tank, right? You totally. Know, so mm -hmm. so it's definitely not just the money, right? Mm -hmm. So we have um, financial capital, but I also want to emphasize on intellectual capital to start with, because you need the strategy, you need the know-how, you need the knowledge and also the navigation to understand how, you know, what it takes from zero to one to 10 to a thousand. And then, um, the next would be human capital, which is the talents, the team. Even when you're a solo founder, you're going to need to uh, acquire talents when you're building. And that's not just something money can buy, um, especially given the culture you want to build, uh, you know, from the, uh, from the start. And then very importantly, this goes to back to my dissertation, Chris, social capital, which is, uh, which is something missing for a lot of founders, especially tech founders that came from, you know, scientist, engineer background, where they might be the best expert in the whole world in their domain of expertise. But if they don't have the network and the connection, their idea and their technology is still stuck in, in their own little universe. So that's really uh, why we emphasize, you know, especially on the community side, the galaxy of innovation, instead of just star network where we have our own universe, but we're sort of disconnected. We, we want to intentionally interconnect otherwise disconnected networks so that we can expand the social capital, which in turn brings the financial capital. Because if you think about it, when you have the intellectual capital, human capital and social capital, financial capital would come naturally. So in other words, I, my observation has been, um, guess what? The best founders, they're never short of financial capital. Like the best founders, in fact, 
funds would have a hard time get onto their cap table. Mm. Um, but there are also tremendous amount of overlooked founders. They're great, but because they don't have the connection, they don't have generations of wealth or generations of connections, they're being still out overlooked. And I really think that's the sweet spot as investors. You know, for us, it's the immigrant and foreign born founders. They're brilliant, you know, performance wise, we have solid data to show. But then on the other hand, because of lack of social capital, they're still, you know, disconnected uh, with financial opportunities like this. So that's sort of the paradox, right? You know, great founders, never short of capital, but then there are tons of brilliant and resilient founders, um, high potential, high performance, but you know, lack of connection. So Does the studio model help solve that problem? Yeah, absolutely. That's why we believe a studio is not just a builder. It is the entire almost like ecosystem universe. When you're working with the studio, you not only have access to the fund, but you have the access to the knowledge, which by the way, we use the baby making as the analogy. You know, when you have the second child, I know you have five, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, you, when you have the second, you're not going to be freaking out when the child have a fever. You have yeah. a lot of shared knowledge passing on. So essentially, you know, there's a lot of uh, intellectual capital that mm -hmm. you can put into your portfolio company. And not to mention the shared talent pool the studio have. And, you know, as a studio, we're constantly building investor relations were actually gathering the talent pool and that can be shared across our portfolio companies so when you're raising as an individual company you don't have to you know reinvent the wheel and build from scratch because you can just tap into the studio resources so that's why we believe um, and data also shows a studio can build much faster at a lower cost. Now, um, um, speaking of those types of startups, you did start, uh, founded, you founded True Leap. Yes. Which is uh, your latest startup. Tell me a little bit about what that is and what kind of problem you're trying to solve. Yeah, that's almost like our third, third child, mm -hmm. right? Okay. It was born out of my 20 years of teaching experience and frustration of current learning management system. So. I don't know if your kids use Blackboard or Canvas in their study or your grandkids. We homeschooled, so we took the uh, the harder route. <laughs> oh, but you essentially, you know, didn't have to bother uh, dealing with those dinosaurs, mm. what I call. Um, they have pretty much occupied all the universities and public school system in the United States, but they're so uh, clumsy <laughs> to use. Just imagine. I am obsessed with efficiency, Chris. Like if I have to click like a dozen times to get to where, where I want to get to, you know, that's enough. Like, um, so essentially as an educator and of course also as a parent of school age children, I just felt like this is really not working. And then, um, when I was comparing notes with, um, my family and friends in India and other country, believe it or not, even, uh, developed countries like Germany, there's a lack of digital infrastructure in those places. They're piecing together a combination of Google Classroom, Google Drive, and Zoom, and Slack or WhatsApp, you know. But then it's almost like imagine when you are learning, you have to deal with all the different interface to stitch them together. Again, it's really not effective. So that's really when I was like, okay, um, on the one hand, I really am proud that my students were probably the most prepared when we switched from in person to online because I already adopted all the, you know, tech stack uh, in my teaching. But then uh, what I saw was my kids were struggling because they switched online and I never used to worry about their academics. And then I realized they were behind. It turns out you know, it's so hard to keep up. The communication is really not ideal. And as a parent, I almost felt like it was a test for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was really hard for also teachers to navigate. I have friends who teach in Atlanta, who's also part of the Women in AI cohort. Um, I was, you know, advising at the time. And turns out they had to go through two weeks of training. So essentially, it's just not working. And um, that's when I decided, okay, we're going to fix this. We're going to, we're going to develop the most user friendly and cost effective learning management system as the starting point of a global education data company. The reason is imagine there's tons of engagement data that's not being captured. Like the moment you finish a zoom meeting, 
like all the chats are gone, all the engagement data is gone. It's not really captured throughout. So essentially, by starting with a learning management system that not only provides um, the interface for the students and the teacher, we also have a lot of insights through a data dashboard for the administrators. Imagine if they have hundreds of schools all over the country, they want to have a one place where they see what's happening. Um, and that's missing too. And that's the reason we started developing with um, some of my you know, school principal friends in the United States. They have private school, like literally building with the users. But then we also uh, very quickly realized the scalability is day and night, because in India, one school would be like tens of thousands of students and one private school system have hundreds of schools. So essentially one contract can get you millions of students. And that's the reason after initial pilot, we then went to India and did 10 successful pilots. We're really excited, especially in the context of the AI boom, everybody's doing like chat GTP plugins, mm -hmm. but that's really um, not the key. That's gonna be hyped down. Um, but what's really missing is the data from all parts of the world. If you think about the emerging market, especially the second tier, third tier, you know, mid tier cities, we have no clue what people um, are doing and we have no clue what's their, you know, cognitive style in terms of learning and in terms of interaction. So that's really our long term vision to have this global education data company that starts with a learning management system, um, you know, go to greenfield. There's no no blackboard or canvas dinosaur to kick out. They they have a blend state. Mm. So essentially market penetration is going to much faster. And then down the road with content management um, and other components to drive the data insight, which will then provide more customized uh, learning solutions for those markets. Sounds great. And really, I mean, this is what happens in some of those greenfield markets is that they leapfrog some of the others because you have to deal with that infrastructure and the incumbent and the software that's not very good you would think this would all be solved already but it is a heavy lift to get those out and a new solution in because hey we've always used this you're right chris i love your leapfrog analysis <laughs> because we talk about innovation a lot right we don't talk enough about resistance to innovation if there's something in place already the resistance the switch cost is so big, it's really hard to kick something out in existence, even when you have a better product. Exactly. So I know you guys also have um, partners in the international markets and you have deep insight to understanding, guess what? There's a lot of emerging markets, they have nothing in place. So all you need is to bring the value of something they really see um, uh, helping them with their operation you know and it's an opportunity for yeah, exactly. a lot of uh you know startups should think of that you know if they're going to somehow replace an incumbent at some point mm -hmm. look at where it's a little bit easier to get some traction learn build you know get that solution working and then bring it back in-house well what advice would you have for aspiring entrepreneurs who are considering working with a venture studio or starting their own startup um so my advice would be stay close to your market, stay close to your users, stay close to your customers. Um, I think we've been through the chasing investor kind of stage and we've seen that um, valuation adjustment happening right now, a lot of bubble bursting. We really need to get back to the value chain when we are really delivering value and getting feedback from the users. Essentially, shift that mindset and spend more time with your team, with your uh, users and deliver something they really love. And then they will become your angels and your advocates and your marketing team essentially, mm -hmm. and get the word out and you know for you to take over the world, but really stay close to your users, your customers and your market. And then also keep in mind, nurture your investor relations so that they know they can see how you're um, conquering all the obstacles along the way. But I really think your best friend right now would be your users and your market. Mm, interesting. Well, thanks for that, Sunny. Um, you know, I like crazy socks. 
<laughs> right? So I think I have something for you here for being on the show. Oh, from the treasure box. Yes. I always wonder. Box, so here you go. <laughs> Fantastic. Teacher socks oh, on yeah, there. Yeah, so. Teacher socks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, thanks it's for fun. your insights and good luck with everything you're doing and building. And uh, you're a force here in Houston. We appreciate you being here. Love the uh, inspiration that you're giving across the board, the venture breakfast that we're starting on a monthly basis. Yeah. Uh, you've got your finger and everything. So thanks for that. Thank you so much, Chris. It's always a pleasure. And I love uh, seeing the exciting happenings at SoftTech and look forward to more collaboration down the road. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Sure.